Broadcasting from the Tazan Lake Lodge Studio. This is Sporting Journal Radio. <laughs> Presented by On X. Know where you stand with On X. Now here's your host, Brett Amundsen. I fish and I always will. Thank you for joining us here on Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen. This is where we talk about hunting and fishing and what's going on in the world of the outdoors. We'll throw some wacky stories at you once in a while. We'll get you the latest fishing reports and catch you up on everything that's happening out there as we continue to preserve the tradition of hunting and fishing uh, for future generations by doing what we can to introduce more people to the the, the sports, uh, further legislation that protects our hunting and fishing traditions and give you some tips to make you better when you're out there on the water or in the woods. Dan Amundsen is right over there. How are you doing, Dan? Yo, yo, doing well. We've been busy lately out chasing uh, fish around and doing some different things. So we're going to we're gonna talk a little bit about what we've uh, been up to, including uh, some fishing reports. And, uh, and w- sometimes you have emergency situations when you're out on the ice, like in an ice castle and... Uh, we'll explain here in just a little bit. It's a unique situation that I guarantee you, you've probably been in once or twice. Uh, we're also going to talk about some underrated snowmobile trails in Minnesota. We'll talk about a chance to go ice climbing nearby. That's kind of a unique thing. And I didn't, I didn't even realize you could do it around here, Dan. Mm-hmm. Um, We will uh, talk about a program that helps clean up after people on the ice. When they're out there ice fishing, inevitably some trash gets left behind. You should do everything you can to keep the ice clean. Uh, There are some programs out there helping to clean up from those that, uh, uh, whether on purpose or not, leave their trash behind. And we'll talk about a brand that was shot in Minnesota. You don't hear about that very often. You do not. It's pretty cool stuff. Dan, who are the sponsors this week? Yeah, our sponsors this week, as always, Haybell Heights Campground and Resort on Devil's Lake. Plan a trip to fish out of a snow bear at Devil's Lake at haybellheights.com. Ottertail Lakes Country, find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Lake of the Woods Tourism, plan a trip at, to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Tazan Lake Lodge, plan a trip of a lifetime to catch giant lake trout and pike at tazanlake.com. Onyx Hunt, know where you stand with Onyx. Mid-Migration Outfitters, rent one of our guided fish houses or start thinking about spring snows in Minnesota. Visit midmigrationoutfitters.com and Prairie Sportsman. Watch episodes anytime at prairiesportsman.org. If you are watching this on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, wherever, make sure you smash that like button. Comment below uh, if you have a story for us or a comment you want to make about today's show. I'm probably going to be asking you a few questions to... uh, about some certain situations that have happened to us and what you've done in that same situation. So comment below, uh, share this with your friends and make sure you like us and follow us. Or if you're listening to this on one of our radio stations, thank you very much. I hope you caught last week's show because Dan, that was a fun show last week. We had the Jasons on, Jason Durham and Jason Rylander. And to celebrate their their budding bromance, we played the newlywed game with them, which was a lot of fun. And you can watch that video on our YouTube channel or Facebook or download the podcast as well too. And we gave away some mugs. We created some custom mugs for him featuring this uh, very lovely photo. Wow. (laughs) The young couple. Uh, (laughs) They loved him so much. I think Jason Durham's mom ordered like five of them. I'm surprised she's not scared of them. Yeah. So we have them for sale. And um, one thing that we're going to do, though, is we're going to sell them in our store at sportingjournalradio.com. But we want to donate uh, some of that we want to pick a charity and donate some of the some of the proceeds to charity. So if you have a good charity, Jasons are thinking about a good charity for us. We're, we're brainstorming, too. But if you can think of a, a good a good fund to raise some money for, let us know and we'll donate some money from uh, the sales of those mugs right there uh, to that fund. Uh, th- that we have that will get set up. Anyway, we spent some time in an ice castle recently, Dan, mm-hmm. and uh, like this this doesn't really it happens to a lot of my buddies. We, we you'll be out hunting somewhere or fishing somewhere, and next thing you know, one of your buddies is missing a sock because he needed to use it for something. That generally doesn't happen to me. I've been very fortunate in those situations. Occasionally, I'll I'll end up having to go to the bathroom when I'm out there, but generally, I I'm able to. Take care of that before I leave or whatever. 
This was not the case recently. And we were in an ice castle and the unspoken rule in the ice castles, we're not using the toilet. And particularly in the wintertime, the toilets don't get used very much. So you, you put a plastic bag in a bucket or you line the, the toilet that's in the ice castle with a plastic bag or whatever type of fish house you're in. Well, we, we weren't even set up yet. We were just trying to find a place to set up that, that ice castle. And I was like, it hit me. Like all of a sudden my stomach just went in, went in circles. And I was like, guys, I got to, I got to go to the bathroom. So we were going to move across the lake. And I said, this would be a perfect time. Just hook up, drive across the lake. I'm going to sit in the bathroom and uh, try to get this done. Well, the bathroom in this particular fish house was very small. So I'm sitting on this small toilet lined with a, with a plastic bag. And don't worry, if you're listening to this on the radio, especially if you're having breakfast, I won't go into too many details with this, but let's just say it was a very bumpy, bouncy ride in a very small bathroom that I was trying not to fall off of. And uh, it was quite the experience. So I want to know, put this in the comments. Have you run into a situation where you've had an emergency bathroom situation? Uh, maybe you were fishing, maybe you weren't, but uh, how, how did it go? Did it go good or bad? Did you have any issues? Comment below for us. And it just so happened that when we were coming off the lake laughing about this, Randon Olson put a video up on Facebook and he said it's one of the most important videos he's ever done. After our guide service, we're in one of the rentals. And one of the biggest questions I get asked is how do you know when the toilet's full and how do you change it? So we're going to show you a little bit. And I want to put a precursor out here. The toilet does not sit in the middle of the floor. I pulled <laughs> it out just so it's easier to show you guys how to change this out. Um, so when you open the lid on these, you'll know when they're full. It'll be over the top. And you can see there's nothing nasty to look at. It's just a tinfoil bag. So the way this gets changed is we pick up the top. And this is the insert right here. So you're going to pick this up and kind of turn it sideways. And you see the black bag? The black bag is going to go right around everything. Look at that. We'll go outside, I'll take care of that, and then you've got the canister itself. So this is where it comes into changing. Every house has a kit here with the extras, the refills, and there's two parts to this. you got a, a bag with the garbage bags in it, and then you got the refills here. So the reason why I'm doing this video is that I've claimed these toilets is the second year I've done this, going on third year. Oh, I was hoping... I was trying to see what he was going to say next, but that doesn't matter. In any case, I've never seen those kits before. That's brilliant. That's uh, that's one way that you could have solved the problem of what I went through the other day. I like that. Yeah, it's Ice Castle's thinking for guys like you. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, thanks, Rand and Olson, Lockjaw Guide Service, for that tip right there. He's up in Otter Tail Lakes Country. So I went up north last weekend, Dan. We went out and did some filming for Prairie Sportsman. We're getting uh, ready to kick off the new season January 23rd on Pioneer PBS. Check your local listings on PBS for airings of Prairie Sportsman. It airs all over the place. If you're listening to this, you can watch PBS on TV somewhere or on our new YouTube channel, or on Facebook, or somewhere else. So check it out. We went and filmed a couple of stories. We stopped uh, We stopped at one place. I'm not going to give away the location yet, but let's just say this is something you can do in Minnesota. I didn't know about this, and we're going to bring you the story on, uh, on an episode of Prairie Sportsman this season, but this is what it looks like. If you want to do that, which I'm going to do it next week, as a matter of fact. I just We just went and filmed these guys climbing ice. Uh, this is ice climbing, and it's farmed ice. So they actually flood these cliffs. They have pumps and hoses. They flood these cliffs, build these ice cliffs, and then people come out, and they have classes and do demonstrations. You can learn to ice climb. So I've never done it before. I'm going to go do it next week, and then we're going to film it for Prairie Sportsman, and we'll have that story for you coming up this season on a PBS station near you. Uh, we also went up to Ely and I uh, did some snowshoeing, learned how to make snowshoes up there. It was, uh, it was a pretty fun, quick trip all the way across Minnesota, pretty much. And uh, you'll be able to watch that stuff coming up this season on Prairie Sportsman. Dan, what's the, what's the most rare bird you shot in Minnesota? You know, that's a tough question. There's two birds that come to mind, and they're not super rare. But two years ago, uh, me and Tony Crotty were shooting some geese and some ducks, and at low light, we uh, shot one goose that sounded a little funny, and it was a speck uh, in western Minnesota, which... <laughs> 
it's one of the coolest sounds. It's one of the sounds in waterfowl hunting that gets my blood rushing, and, and it's kind of like buck fever. I get spec fever a little bit. Um, but yeah, we were able to shoot that bird. We kind of tag teamed it, and that was the highlight of that season. And it's still, it's the only spec I've ever even seen shot on any hunt. I don't really hunt outside of Minnesota that much anymore. Um, so it was pretty neat. Um, then this year I was able to, to take a, a nice Drake pintail, hmm. which I had never taken in before period, let alone in Minnesota. And, you know, you might see some bigger sprigs in out West, but uh, for yeah. Minnesota is a really cool bird and it's waiting to go on the wall. So you shot that pintail. Yeah. You get a few of them through here, but they usually don't look very good until pretty, they get down South. But you know, specs, it's interesting specs. I think the population of white fronted geese is growing. I think maybe their flyway is spreading. Their migration route is spreading maybe a little bit eastward because we're seeing more specks and snows for that matter in Minnesota. And as a matter of fact, uh, on opener this year in Minnesota, I've talked about it on this show, on opener this year, I shot my first Minnesota spec. I've shot them in Arkansas, but I've never shot them up here. So on opener, we shot a handful of them, uh, me and some buddies. And, uh, and then this spring, I shot pretty much shot my first Minnesota snow goose as well. So it, it was kind of a, a good year. And those birds aren't getting as rare in Minnesota as they used to. But one bird that is, is a Brant. And uh, the guy that shot it is joining us now here on the show, Thor. Thor, how's it going, man? Thor Nelson, how's it going? Yeah, so that was definitely one of the coolest waterfowling experiences, hands down the coolest waterfowling experience I've ever had a chance of um participating in we were hunting on armistice day uh we were hunting like one me and two other buddies um there was a lot of ducks flying around and we saw these two bigger birds in the day. first we thought they were a couple allards i was actually quacking at them and it seemed like they responded to the call and they came in and they sat right down in the decoys actually and when they were cupping in and when they were right face i identified i thought they were uh merganser right away Luckily, we had enough banter back and forth in the blind that we decided they were um, lessers or some form of a small goose. And we were thinking lessers because they were darker. Um, and yeah, some of my buddies had different angles on the profile of the water. Um, so yeah, we went and take, took them. And yeah, it was, it was a pretty unbelievable moment to pick those birds up on the water because, I mean, that's something that will never happen again you know in the state of minnesota i mean maybe it will but it was it was pretty ridiculous it's every waterfowler's dream come true to have that type of stuff happen and be able to cap and film and everything i mean tell the story yeah and those are definitely two birds that are going on the wall without a doubt <laughs> and i can see how you could mistake them for a lesser looking at that video right there and obviously you're not thinking brand you know, part of identifying waterfowl, I think a lot of times is um, knowing what waterfowl species are generally in your area. And Brent, you wouldn't think Brent right away. So when you pull, when you go out there and pick them up, man, that had to have been a pretty wild experience. That's pretty neat. Yeah, and that was one of the things that I addressed in the, the video too, you know, in some of the post commentary because I got some ridicule from people. I knew it was going to happen, um, but I got some ridicule from people about, you know, why didn't you ID those birds? You always have keyboard warriors that are the yeah. best waterfowlers on the planet. Uh, I mean, how is somebody that's a minute supposed to be able to identify what they were? I mean, they even made a couple of noises on the water, and, you know, it just, to me, it sounded like a uh, common merganser. I mean, that was the closest noise I could relate it to. But uh, listening to their audio on the Ducks Unlimited app afterwards, it's like, yeah, that you know, kind of sounds like a muffled mallard feeder chuckle. So I mean, I, it was it was weird, but I mean, it happened, and super grateful for it. it was awesome. Have you done much hunting in that area? Have you seen other? You hear about uh, like maybe sea ducks get shot over in that area every so often. Um, have you seen any other types of ducks up there? Because you go to Bemidji State, right? Yeah, I do go to school in Bemidji State. Uh, and I mean, I rarely get home between uh, my class schedule and work schedule as well. Stay pretty busy, especially throughout the fall. It's hard to help me. Uh, in regards to sea ducks, yes, we, we do see a fair amount of them, actually. And I've had several friends that have had the opportunities uh, to take a few. And typically, it is either a hen surf scoter or a hen old squaw. Those are the most common that we see being taken in this area 
whether that is on um, Leech Lake or Lake Winnebagash, uh or some of the larger lakes in the area has always attracted them. But those two are definitely the biggest two for attracting any potential at a sea duck. And I know that there was some uh, rumors this year when there was birds wrapped up on the Midgey and some bird watchers from the state park said that they saw some surf scoters out there. So they're spread throughout the area a little bit. They get lost back. That's pretty cool. Well, we're, uh, we, we're having just a, a few technical issues here with you. So we're, we're going to wrap things up, but we're going to have you back because you're obviously part of sporting journal radio now. So congratulations and, uh, welcome aboard the team. Yeah, I'm super excited. So couldn't, uh, couldn't be happier. Thorne Elson, thanks for being part of the show. And, uh, we got a lot of work for you. So <laughs> buckle up. Coming up, we're going to talk to uh, Joe Henry about the Northwest Guest Ice Road that's uh, finally opening up. We'll talk about Lake of the Woods and keeping lakes clean. And then we're going to talk about some underrated snowmobile trails with Eric Osberg on the way. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye and they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. All right, time once again to head up to Lake of the Woods to find out what's going on on that big walleye factory with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism. Joe, how you doing? Brett, that factory is still pushing out fish like you wouldn't believe. It's good, uh, good stuff, man. I bet. And uh, always, it seems like there's always news. Every week, every week when we talk to you here on the show, there's more news coming out. And the big news recently is the guest ice road to the Northwest Angle is back. It is, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's funny because – you know, we had the, the, the Northwest Angle Guest Ice Road last year, and um, it you know really it was, it was uh, something that came from the resort uh, resorts up at the Northwest Angle, as well as a couple small businesses, and it was out of necessity because Canada was closed; you could not cross the border, so that gave people a way to drive up to the Northwest Angle. Uh, it saved a lot of the resorts for their winter business. Now this year, there was question whether the Northwest Angle Guest Road would happen or not because. There's so many other ways to get up there. You know, right now you can you can snowmobile up on the lake. You can uh, take the Lake of the Woods Passenger Service, which is a bombardier service that goes uh, on the lake, consequently staying in Minnesota. You don't have to cross the border. It takes you up around trip to whatever resort you want to go. There's Lake Country Air, and that flies you up to the Northwest Angle Lands on the ice to whatever resort you want. Again, you don't have to deal with border. And if you want to drive up, um, if you're vaccinated, you can, uh, you know, drive up. you got to be vaccinated and have a... a a COVID test is less than 72 hours old and no problem driving right through Canada. So because there is different ways to get up to the Northwest Angle, we weren't sure if, if uh, this would happen or not. Well, the main plowing business up at the Northwest Angle is called Points North Services. And they were thinking about doing it with the good ice we have and with some of the uh, demand that people have been saying, hey, please open the ice road. They actually uh, plowed it this week. So this ice road is going to be about the same. It takes off on the south end. It's Spring Steel Resort. You follow Spring Steel's road out about eight miles, I believe. And then from there, um, you know, they, they piggyback off of that start of the road. And then they go you know, all the way down, uh, all the way north, I should say. And then they actually stay on the ice the whole time. So this ice road is about 30 miles of all ice. And that's oh. going to take you up to all the different Northwest Angle resorts. So it's a little different than last year. It is a little different, yeah. Last year we had 22 miles of ice and eight miles of going through a forest. And yeah. this year the ice is good, so they're gonna go uh, 30 miles of ice. Ah, interesting. Well, it's a pretty unique way to get up there. And of course, any any way you can get up to the angle possible, you owe it to yourself to go up there and experience what the Northwest Angle has to offer and to be able to drive across, because who knows if, it, if it'll be back la next year. You know, last year, Joe, we talked about it 
potentially being a once in a lifetime opportunity to drive up there like that on this on this guest ice road and here we are it's happening again for people that didn't get a chance to do it last year here's an opportunity for them to do it this year why would i would you know if you have an interest in hitting ice road if you said to yourself man we should have done that last year Right. Jump on it. And I'll tell you why. And I'm not just saying this to promote it, but we don't know what's going to be here next year. This will be kind of the experiment because, you know, there, there are other ways to get up there. So, you know, the revenue is getting divided and we'll, we'll see if it's uh, worthwhile doing it or not this year. Time will tell. But but Point Star Services has taken it on and uh, it's going to be a good road. I uh, heard the ice conditions are good. And uh, uh, for the most part, it's very smooth road and it's going to get you up to the, some of the best fishing in North America through the ice. So we're uh, we're into the ice fishing season now. What a good good month or so, probably around there, three to four weeks of the the ice fishing season. You're starting to see remnants of people prior to you being in that spot on the lake. Some people are real good about cleaning up after themselves. Some people are not. Uh, you have a you have a, a kind of a, a program up there at Lake of the Woods to help keep it clean on the lake, don't you? Yeah, we sure do, Brett. In fact, we call it Keep It Clean. And, you know, this uh, this was started a number of years ago. I want to say, I'll, I'll guess and say seven years ago. But, you know, what, what what happened was the friends of Zippo Bay State Park one spring during their cleanup when the ice goes out, they actually hit, picked up like, gosh, I don't know if it was five or six trailers full of garbage that blew up on the beach. And it's just because the wind was just perfect coming in from an ice fishing area. So they picked up all this trash. And, of course, the, the conversation was, where would this stuff be going? Yeah. If, if, you know, it didn't blow up on this beach and we didn't pick it up, you know, if the wind's a different direction, is it going to go down in the water? Some of it will. Is it going to go to a, a, a barren shoreline that's wilderness and nobody sees it and just stays there? And, you know, it kind of made you feel sick. So what we did is we pulled together a group of stakeholders from the area, everything from, um, you know, uh, Lake of the Woods and Cooch County, uh, soil and water. Uh, we have co- uh, county board members. We have DNR Fisheries, DNR Enforcement. Um, we have, gosh, uh, myself, Lake of the Woods Tourism. Um, uh, we have the county engineer, I think. On, you know, we have different mm. different stakeholders that, that are important for this mission. And, you know, I'll tell you something. Uh, we've worked real hard to promote, uh, enforce, and educate people on the Keep It Clean program. You know, we started out having a dumpster service where people could put their garbage in the dumpster. And that, that worked out really nice as far as having a dumpster is a different large ice roads, but where we, where the program ran into trouble was, um, we started getting into the garbage removal business. You know, it, it just got to be unsustainable. It, it, it just wasn't sustainable because there was literally tons and tons and tons of garbage coming in these dumpsters. And then, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the garbage coming in was uh, theft of service. It wasn't ice anglers. It was, oh, just a, a myriad of different people thought they could put their burn, burned up snowmobiles or couches or TVs or their own personal oh, garbage in there. So, and then that, that combined with, you know, resorts that were already investing in dumpsters and dumpster service for their customers, you know, they kind of looked at it and said, well, gosh, if we're doing the right thing and investing in these services, being that we make a profit when people go down the lake, how come, how come, you know, the service has to be available? Shouldn't everybody go out on that? So for all those reasons, now we got rid of the dumpsters and it's really a promotional organization. We have the keep it clean logo. We put out videos, we have a website. Um, we, we work with the DNR. So they're enforcing this if they find people leaving litter behind and Good. really a lot of threat, like you said, this the, the majority of people, ice anglers, do a great, great job. I think where where we run into problems is that, for instance, on Lake of the Woods, we have 2.9 million angling hours. With 2.9 million angling hours, you don't need very many people to cause a lot of garbage that goes into our environment. So there's some people that don't mean to do harm, but they maybe just don't think it out on the front end. Meaning, you got a sleeper fish house. You know what? You're there for three nights. You start putting some garbage bags outside on the ice. Um, you start putting your whatever kind of whatever's in your bags out on the ice. It snows out. They freeze in. You mean to take them all. You don't see them all or they're frozen in. So you pull them and now the plastic bag rips and the contents go onto the ice and plastic's frozen in. And you, you see how this goes. And then, mm-hmm. then, of course, you have some people that just don't care. They leave their garbage out there intentionally. And then you got some people that maybe they're driving off the ice and they, they got some garbage in the back of their pickup bed because they don't want to bring the garbage in the front cab with them. And, and it blows out. It blows yeah. out. Yeah. Whether it's on a lake or that first half mile when you get onto a road and make it up to 60 miles an hour. 
Well, and it's going to be windy on the lake. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be windy, especially on a place like Lake of the Woods. It's going to be windy out there. And what your point about thinking about it on the front end is very important. And a lot of people don't think about that. Oh, do I, are my electronics charged up? Do I got my, you know, do I got bait? Do I got this? Do I got all my fishing gear? Whatever. Let's go. You're in such a, a rush. You're so excited to go fishing. You don't think about what to do with the garbage when you're done. And inevitably there's going to be garbage beer cans or whatever the case may be. And making sure that you not only have garbage bags, but a place to put those garbage bags to keep them secure is important. And for the people that don't care about it, like I never understood that, that, that thought process that says, yeah, I don't don't care. I can leave my garbage here, especially when you're on a lake. Like what, you think the ice is going to melt and it's just going to sink to the bottom and, and disappear? Or the, you know, I, I feel like that's the, the type of person that goes to a fast food restaurant and as soon as they're done eating, they take their whole bag and chuck it out their window and they're driving down the road. And man, I want to take, if I see somebody do that, <laughs> you might see a case of road rage from me. Like yeah. that's, that's the kind of stuff that drives me absolutely bonkers. But um, I, I think, come on, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, come on, man. Jeez, uh, 2.9 million angling hours, Joe. I remember just a couple of years ago when we were talking about 2 million angling hours. It's up to 2.9 now. That is an amazing amount of uh, fishing pressure on the lake up there. Uh, obviously, the fishing must be good if that many people are going up there and fishing. Well, and Brent, I'll tell you this. You know what? Uh, uh, Mille Lacs Lake isn't far behind. They're right behind us. And, you know, that's, that's with a one fish limit and a slot limit. But, you know, ice fishing is popular. Mille Lacs has a great population of walleyes, and uh, they're close to proximity to population. The Twin Cities and St. Cloud and different places like that. So you can see why they get the traffic, and, and it's a great lake to fish. It's fun fishing Mille Lacs. You know, I'm, the, the, you know some people consider them part, uh, uh, competitors, and, you know, the yeah. way we look at it when we're talking about keep it clean, we're partners in success, as is uh, uh, Upper and Lower Red Lake and, and, and all the walleye belt lakes. You know, we're all, we're all in this thing together. I'll tell you the other thing, Brett, what's coming down the pipe is that uh, we're working real hard with our Keep It Clean Committee to see what kind of regulations are coming down the road. Yeah. Things such yeah. as the MPCA and you know oh. uh, human, fe- mm. human feces, and how do you dispose of feces? And uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, a topic that you don't like to talk about, but it's real life. And you know, uh, so we're, we're already taking measures up at Lake of the Woods and, and how to do things the right way. You'll notice that now when you go into some of our sleeper fish house businesses or our resorts that offer sleeper fish houses, you know, they'll have, instead of using plastic bags um, in a uh, kind of a, uh, you know, the old traditional bathroom that might be within a sleeper fish house, you know, you, you might see porta potties. In some oh. cases, you, you got some uh, experimental uh, compost biffies, hmm. um, di- different things that you're not going to have that plastic bag. Now, you think about it, when you have, you uh, um, you know, organic materials from the human being and you have a plastic bag, the organics aren't as bad for the environment. We don't want them to go in the lake, but they're not as bad for the natural resource as the plastic bag is. So when, when you're thinking this stuff out, the other thing is when you do get it off the lake, how do you dispose of it then? Because now you have all this, you know, human waste in all these plastic bags. How do you, when you bring them to the landfill, how do they deal with it? So there's a number of issues that we're looking into, and this isn't just a Lake of the Woods issue. This is an no. ice belt issue, and we're we're on the I think we're on the forefront of trying to uh, solve some of these problems. Uh, we're also obviously working on the uh, the actual garbage itself problem, um, and just awareness. You know, just talking about it now, and you know, th- again, this isn't the Lake of the Woods thing. This is anybody who ice fishes, any popular ice fishing lake. Even the non the, the ones that aren't popular and the smaller. Imagine if you have a home on a small lake, and you see people out there parked for the weekend, and they leave, and then you head out fishing during the week when all the crowds have gone away, and you find garbage. How yeah. would that make you feel? Not, I wouldn't be happy about it. And believe me, I know the I know the bag situation because I recently went through it, and I was not happy. It was not a pleasant experience, as it it never is for anybody that has to do that. But it was it was kind of one of those emergencies. I won't go into too many details, Joe. <laughs> believe me. But it was one of those emergency situations. We had just gotten on the lake, like just gotten out there. And uh, I don't know, I ate a beef stick and a cheese stick on, on the ride out there. And next thing I know, when we got, when we, as soon as the, we put the house down, my stomach went like that. And I said, huh, what's our situation out here? So immediately had to get the bag and then deal with that bag. And 
uh, until until the trip was over, and then we put it in the garbage bag, and then put it in the dumpster when we got home here. So that's a that's not always a fun situation to deal with, but you you, you find ways to deal with it. And I'd be interested to find out more about some of these other solutions. Like uh, porta potty seems like a lot of work to go through, but maybe maybe it's worth it. But one of those uh, composting type toilets out there, maybe that's maybe that's a, a good solution and i want to bring up one more thing here too joe because i was doing a little bit of research about this i was looking back and th this is for a longer discussion but i was looking back at it back at historical license sales in minnesota um, because everybody talks about the decline of this and the decline of that and yes our hunting license numbers have gone down but based on the quick glance that i looked at for 2020 we sold almost 500,000 resident season i think resident angling license like full season angling licenses annuals uh and that was that was the highest number i could see without looking closer that was the highest number of resident full fishing licenses for the season in 2020 can't imagine that 2020 uh, that this year or last 2021 is going to be far behind that or Maybe it's ahead of it. I don't know. But do you think when you say 2.9 million angling hours, do you think that's because of this COVID, a couple of years of COVID when fishing license sales have spiked and more and more people are getting into the outdoors? Or do you think it's just, you know, wheelhouses, whatever, more and more people are getting onto that lake? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's both. And I think that it's probably the new norm. Um, I think the year before might have been, if I remember correctly, 2.7 million. So, you know, we thought that that might be uh, an incredibly high spike because of COVID, but then we followed up with 2.9 and it just seems like that's the norm. And to your point, I mean, you know, d during the pan, ice fishing has, it gained, has been gaining popularity anyway. And then the pandemic just accelerated that growth yeah. and more people getting into it. And then, you know, um, and, the, and the wheelhouses. You know, one thing about a wheelhouse is that, you know, you're not going out in a collapsible fishing uh you know, for, for five, five to eight hours, you know, or whatever you're going to fish, you're, you're out there living out there 24 hours a day in many cases and lines are down 24 hours a day. So it, it has an impact and, and you count that in your Creel surveys when you're, you're doing statistics. So, um, and I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing at all. I, people, you know, there's pros and cons, to everything in life. You know, the way I look at it is when you take a look at Airbnbs and VRBOs, they affect the resorts and hotels, right? But, but they're wildly popular. When you take a look at Uber and Lyft, that certainly affects the taxi cab business, yet they're wildly popular and they're not going back. When we take a look at wheelhouses, that certainly will affect the, the, the lodging industry, the traditional lodging industry with you know, resorts and hotels and such, but we're not going back. You know? And, and um, people love them. They use them all seasons. It brings more families outside. It brings people that aren't the hardcore ice anglers out on ice, perhaps because it's nice for accommodations. There's a lot of good things to it, but there's also the fact that we're putting more pressure on our resources with lines down 24 hours a day and more yeah. people are out fishing. And so, you know, like anything, there's pros and cons of everything we do in life. And we just have to adapt and make sure that, you know, we're taking care of our resources so that we have it for it. Like we we always talk about for generations to come. And that's part of our not only responsibility, but also accountability. Well, I think obviously uh, as tourism director with nearly another million angling hours, you need a raise and people are listening and <laughs> watching you. to this radio show clearly and learning about uh, how great it is up there at Lake of the Woods. Well, um, I'm sure fish are biting up there and we've had you on longer than we planned to this week. Uh, people can get a fishing report on your website anytime, Joe, or on uh, your Facebook page. Where should they go? Where can they learn more about Lake of the Woods? Yep. You know what? Lake of the Woods Tourism Facebook, you mentioned it. Otherwise, our website, and that is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com.
Winter recreation is in full force right now, and obviously a lot of people are ice fishing, but there's so many other things you can do while you're out there. Maybe you can combine them. I always like to try to combine trips into a, a bunch of different things. We're going to go up to Otter Tail Lakes Country now to check in with Eric Osberg to find out what people are doing outdoors to find their inner otter up there. Eric, how you doing, man? I'm pretty good. How are you doing, Brett? I'm doing well. Got to do a little bit of fishing. Had some interesting experiences on the lake. And uh, just for your sake, I won't go into much more detail than that right now. Uh, but it was fun. Fishing was good. Where we were, Eric, um, the ice was in pretty good condition. This was before. Uh, I know we got uh, some storms, recent storms here. Uh, this was before we got more snow. Where, where we were at, there wasn't a whole lot of snow on the lakes. How are the lakes up in Ottertail County right now? less than ideal <laughs> and i i don't want to i don't want to discourage anybody from of from course. coming but i don't want i don't want to sugarcoat it either um we've gotten a lot of snow i mean you know the 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 post christmas storm i mean that was pretty near 18 inches and then you know and then we got another six right after that so we our ice was setting up real good and then we got a bunch of snow and, and with snow comes weight, and with weight comes water. And so I'm not saying it's it's shot, and, and, and ice has a way of healing itself over time. I'm just saying uh, be prepared to, to use alternative means of travel. Um, you know, the lake I'm on, there's 16 inches of ice, which is great, right? I uh, got the fish house out and everything, but but there's pockets of slush. Uh, I walked out onto a lake recently because I knew that the conditions um, weren't going to be great. And and so I walked out and there was a thin layer of crust and then underneath that was water. And then underneath that was like 10 to 12 inches. I, did, I didn't measure because I was walking. I, I knew there was enough to walk. But it, um, it uh, yeah, it's less than ideal. So come up. If, if you've got track machines, whether they're snowmobiles or or not, um, they might be a good idea. We're finally getting enough snow where I'm at to be able to get my snowmobile out. I'm going to be able to hook up my portable behind it and head out, and hopefully, into some lakes that, um, you know, we can't drive out on or maybe go exploring a little bit. I like that idea of being able to get out and combine a snowmobiling trip and a fishing trip. And that's something we could do up there. Right, Eric? It is absolutely, and 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 for snowmobile a destination, you know, a pure snowmobile trip destinations, uh, Ottertail County is very underrated. Um, we've got, and uh, this is a ballpark number. This isn't an exact number, but there's roughly 600 miles of trails within Ottertail County, groomed wow. trails, yeah. and and and. If too much snow means that the lakes are in less than ideal conditions, that means that the trails are in ideal conditions. Yeah. And, and I was, I, I was just out recently, and um, yeah, there's, there's, you know, you could go from map from from lake to lake to lake to lake to lake to lake. Um, I was out recently on some trails, and the, I, we were, I was with the groomer. I was learning how grooming works, and um, the trail system in Ottertail County is in tip-top shape there's a good eight to ten inches of packed snow underneath and they're getting the groomers out you know warmed up a little bit this week and 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 that helps um there's there's warming houses like i didn't know this but but there's warming houses along the trail system and it's not a it's it's a three quarters it's a three-sided structure shelter and then there's little shelter there's fire pit there's uh, it, it, the at least at the warming house that we were at, they had wood already there, cut and ready to go, um, and and you know with the diversity that you topography wise, there's you know we have a diverse area, right? The southwest corner of the county is is kind of more open, more farmland. The the north the the northeast is is wooded and, and and a little bit of hills and a lot of lakes and then the northwest is super hilly super wooded super lakey so um yeah the the it, it's it's a really cool way and i don't i don't want to get too cute but it's a really cool way to find your inner otter in the winter sure. These, the, the the trails that i were on today i was like oh my gosh i had no idea and so yeah and that's maplewood state park um maplewood state park has groomed trails within the park 
Uh, those are in good condition too. I haven't, I don't have first-hand knowledge, but I did just read the report and they, <clears throat> they say they're good. Um, so there's lots of snowmobiling opportunities in Ottertail County, Minnesota. I just had a, a buddy of mine, Jason Markla, uh, just brought his family up there and snowmobiled around Maplewood State Park. Said it was unbelievable up there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've been to Maplewood musky fishing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've been there in the fall. Insert, you know, swap out the orange and the, and the yellows and the reds and insert white. And it, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I There's another small park right on the east side of Ottertail County. It's called Black's Grove. Okay, and this this is a really a hidden gem. It's a, it's not a snowmobile park or anything like that. It's a cross country skiing snowshoeing park. And I I was I went out there the other night just because I got done with work and I wanted some fresh air. It's close to where I live, and and I you know it, it's thickly wooded. I mean, there's trail system through there, but it's thickly wooded and all the branches have snow on them. So it was like this canopy. Of, oh, of cool, cool of, of cool you know what i mean like it was yeah and there was i saw i saw like five deer i you know there were deer out there it's just there's so whether it's maplewood state park glendalow state park phelps mill park blacks grove park you know if you're into walking or snowshoeing or cross-country skiing um there's all sorts of that going on obviously if you're into snowmobiling We've got what I think is a very underrated trail system and a lot of dedicated volunteers and workers who, who, who work to make that trail a, a, a good system. Well, there it is. There's Jason, and it's probably his kid Will right there, uh, Rooster Logger. And that was what I, in that picture, that's what I was just going to bring up about like Maplewood State Park and Ottertail County, really in general. Uh, you know, where I'm at uh, south of you, an hour, two hours south of you, it's so it's so flat kind of where we're at flat and ag country. And we got trails around here, but it's going through a lot of ditches and a lot of cornfields, basically look at the Hills, look at the terrain, that rolling topography that you got up, that you've got up there. I mean, to me, that'd be a blast to rip around on for a few hours. Yeah. And even, and we were, yeah, like I said, we were on a trail and it would be the Purim to New York mills trail, which is, I would consider the Northeast corridor. And and it was it was it was tight and it was curvy and it was up and it was down and and we weren't in the hilly part of the county right we were in the northeast part of the county the New York to to Perm New York Mills to Perm Trail and uh, it was it was it was a, I was in the groomer and that was you know so it was there was times I was like okay what's the what's the balance point on this groomer right like when, <laughs> <laughs> at what point do I have to hold on. Explain how the groomer works. Well, I, I, and I, I asked the question, like, how does this thing work? And it, it's got a plow on the front, right? So the, any, any, whether it's coming out of a ditch or going into a ditch or crossing, whatever. So it's got a plow on the front. It's a tracked machine. And then on the back, what, what he, the way it was explained to me is what you're doing is you're, you're loading the, the mechanism up with snow, and it actually kind of heats. It's almost like a zamboni in a way. It it heats up the snow, and so it over t you know. So if you go over it once, and then you go over it twice, it, it almost gives it a a, a a a freeze, if you will. It's not a hard freeze like an ice freeze, but yeah. So it smooths everything out. It gives everything a little bit of a, a, a firmness because it, it you're creating heat through some mechanism. I don't know if it's forced in or if it's just the friction or what it is but uh but yeah the being in a groomer is 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 pretty cool it's super comfortable inside the groomer heats on <laughs> radios on sure um it was a it was a gorgeous day so we were cheating a little bit but uh yeah the, that's a you know there's there's operators and there's drivers right and and if there's anybody out there who's ever operated a groomer they deserve a pat on the back because there's a lot of things going on at the same time and I could imagine uh, you could do it wrong. And the guy I was with was a seasoned pro, and and he knew what he was doing. So it uh, it all looked good to me, anyways. I think we got. Do we have a picture of one of those groomers? Dan's gonna pull up one of those pictures here in just a second. Um, oh yeah, that's what it looked like right yeah. there, pretty much, Eric. S similar. This was the track system was different, and the in the trailer or the groomer in the back was a little bit different. Um, right. but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that's basically the concept. Um, the one thing he did point out is he, is, if, as you're looking at that picture, he said, they make these really big, huge windows, right? And you spend 
at least half of your time looking in the little bit itty bitty rear view mirror. <laughs> so, <laughs> cause you're always, you know, you're always worried about the thing behind you. Right. Um, so, so I, if there's any engineers out there listening, I, I get it. It's trails. You can't be too wide. I understand why the mirrors are as skinny as they are, but, uh, a little more mirror wouldn't hurt. So, so if somebody wants to go up there and do this, um, are there trailheads? Are there parking areas? Uh, where can they learn about where to start when they go up there? Well, and I wish I had a good online answer. I don't. I don't know right off the top of my head. You know, Otter, uh, the Otter Trail Riders Club. You know, they they're a, they're a club, Otter Trail Riders Club, and there's many clubs in the area. Um, I I don't know where there is an online map, but I know that there's physical maps, and and so again, I I said there's roughly 600 miles of trails if you can get your hands on one of those physical maps uh there's places to park there's put you know and, and the local hospitality industry welcomes snowmobile snowmobilers right like sure. if you want to go you know you can park here there's trail heads park here get your sleds unloaded go in and grab a burger a cup of coffee or, or whatever it is right and sure. then you go and and i think you and i have talked about this before brett how What's unique about Ottawa County is it's the places in between the places, right? So you've got New York Mills, Purim, Pelican Rapids, Battle Lake, Henning. You, you know what I mean? You could otter tail. You can visit all of these communities on this trail. So it's um, it's a neat way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's that's the Facebook page of the Otter Trail uh, Rider Snowmobile Club. Gotcha. Um, they're doing a good they do a good job of keeping people up to date on their facebook page of what the conditions are or what they're doing but uh yeah if you want to find your inner out of this winter i'm not saying you shouldn't come up to go ice fishing sure i'm just saying if you have snowmobiles and you have a trailer you might want to bring your snowmobiles with too um because to your point you could go out on a, on a you know ice fishing you know that whole you know run and gun type thing um or um or you can just hit the trails and and put yeah. some tip ups close to shore. Well, I was just talking to my buddy Tony Crotty earlier today, as a matter of fact, and we were joking, we both have snowmobiles that are older than Dan and and we you know, we kinda have them for uh for ice fishing, but it would be kinda fun to go trail riding again. So maybe we'll have to make a uh what well, wouldn't be a cast and blast, what would we call it? A a uh a ride and drop down a hole. <laughs> <laughs> what rhymes with ride? Yeah, ride and slide is the only thing that comes to we'll, my mind. We'll figure it out. We'll put it together. We'll put together a trip up to Otter Tail Lakes Country for snowmobiling and uh, and fishing. Uh, Eric, if people want to find more information about Otter Tail Lakes Country, what should they do? They can find their inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.